Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Billy Fisher, and I'm actually super excited to present uh, what I learned at OzCon this year in Portland, mainly because it's finally over, <laughs> and I could finally present some of the conflicting feedback I got, um, and uh, got some really interesting Agile perspectives. So I'll go ahead and share what I learned over the next 30 minutes, and then uh, I'll take questions after. <clears throat> so for me, attending OzCon was a really high priority this year because it was really transformative for me in 2014. So uh, I, I was actually willing to take PTO to, for an entire week uh, to go, and it actually turned out that didn't actually need to happen since my org was super awesome in supporting me and going in addition to the single slot that we had open. Uh, I qualified for the 20% alumni discount, which was super awesome. It helped with that. And <clears throat> that also included uh, admittance into the Community Leadership Summit uh, the weekend leading up to OzCon. And I didn't really know what was coming this year for because uh, InterSource is a big theme of this year's OzCon. And I didn't. I thought InterSource is a product or a service, and it turns out those are both wrong. <laughs> uh, it's actually a movement uh, similar to open source. So, uh, and it gave me a lot of. Uh, context around community leadership that's also very much related to inner source um, even even though the community leadership summit focuses more on open source uh, so in 2014 i was actually really curious about why open source was actually entering my life from the enterprise perspective right so i had grown up with inner source and had played with linux as a kid and in high school and college but i never got to use it in my day job uh, i worked for a microsoft shop for eight years and <clears throat> they had made a massive shift off of all the microsoft stacks straight on the open stack uh, VMware vSphere, uh, you know, Java frameworks, Python for operations. Uh, Linux was taking over the Windows Server 2003 and 2008 deployments at the time. So I wanted to know why, why is this happening? Why are we investing $12 million in R&D to make all this happen? So <clears throat> in getting answers to those questions, <clears throat> I actually got a sense of flow and discipline, actually, that kind of revitalized some of my enthusiasm. Uh, for development in general, because I was a little down coming out of the downturn from the 2007 and 2008 recession. So uh, I wasn't actually sure I wanted to take a tech job, to be honest. I was kind of on my way out. <laughs> so I had worked for that company for eight years and uh, had been part of continuous layoffs for four years. And so <clears throat> oddly enough, I got additional work-life balance by participating in open source because we had all these initiatives uh, for a number of years and in 2014 I had the opportunity to start contributing to the open source libraries we were consuming. It actually freed up a lot of my focus in the office because a lot of the extraneous technical stuff I usually care about and all the other <laughs> devs here probably care about. Uh, I was a little freed up from that so I actually got support from the open source community both in the evenings and during the day, right? So uh, my day job got way easier so I'm only focused on uh, their initiatives. I'm not worried about so much what's going on with the rest of the integration since I have support beyond the company for that. So <clears throat> my engagement is improving both in my day job and uh, in tech in general. Uh, I retooled on <clears throat> Java and OpenStack and kind of became a DevOps evangelist in the process, oddly enough. Um, so it's really conferences like OzCon and meetups like it that actually is why I'm here presenting in front of you today. Um, probably wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for that experience. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be covering what I've come to learn as, for lack of a better term, sprint safe disengagement, which is probably going to be super confusing at first. But what it's really talking about is uh, how do you get further engagement throughout the enterprise? How do you enable further contributions to inter-source initiatives end to end in the enterprise, not just your department, but other departments? And how do you accelerate your business unit's velocity towards shared goals across the organization? And then I'll be touching on what exactly is inter-source because it's not a product or a service. <laughs> it's actually a movement. So <clears throat> that was actually confusing for me when I had first heard about it. And thanks to Lauren, I actually did go to the, all those sessions. I actually was, I actually had X them all out on my calendar. So uh, the, the day really started for me, uh, other than getting some context around what InterSource was before reading the book I'm about to present, uh, I went to a session by Alan Holub titled Incremental Architecture, and that focused on domain-driven uh, development. It focused on more agile architectures, so that way your, your domain-driven teams can respond to change rapidly. Uh, so I was like, well, it's a little too late for that because I'm already in the org. It's already pretty well established, right? So 
not that you can't in, in, incrementally improve, which is what I thought the talk was going to be about, and it turns out that wasn't true. But there's an agile perspective that actually came in direct conflict with the experience I have <clears throat> had working in agile organizations for the last 10 years, and that was to stop writing technical stories. And I was bashed over the head with this all week <laughs> by the agile coaches. I was like, this is really strange because uh, a large percentage of the back backlogs I've been a part of the last 10 years at multiple organizations have all been technical stories. The vast majority of have, have, have been. Um, so I had never heard this before. Uh, it was surprising when I mentioned it to people here. They're like, no, no, you need technical stories. I'm like, well, that's not what they told me. <laughs> so I don't know what that means, right? So, uh, and I guess I'm not too shocked about it because Agile does value people over process, right? So I can see the wiggle room there, and that's why you have Scrum, but, right? We all have our different flavors of Agile, depending whether you're doing Kanban or Scrum. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try not to obsess over the details too much. So during the session, this is all going through my mind, and I asked myself, well, what is a user story? <clears throat> Has it changed in the last 10 years? I don't know. According to Alan, it's a narrative that takes a user through some process that results in a valuable outcome for that user, right? Which is kind of boring from my perspective. It hasn't changed in the last 10 years, so it's the same thing I heard 10 years ago. Uh, but I hadn't, <laughs> haven't I used user stories a whole lot in the last 10 years in the multiple organizations that I've served, which is kind of a little strange. Uh, so that didn't really answer my question, does it? Uh, it still doesn't answer the question, how does the technical stories fit in this new model of thinking if we're no longer writing technical stories? I still didn't get an answer to that question. So in trying to dig that answer up, uh, many books that I consulted actually cite Nyberg 2011, uh, where they observed that uh, your technical stories actually end up being technical tasks, basically. Um, and they should be represented as uh, in your functional user stories as being reliant on this technical work. Um, that's starting to make a little bit more sense, even as a developer, right? Because sure, in sprint planning and PI planning, my team comes up with like maybe four to six technical tasks that have to happen, right, for this user story to happen for our internal and external stakeholders. But it actually turns out that's not the whole story. <laughs> Because from their perspective, they want to know when can they integrate and prod, right? That's the request I get all the time. And the answer is like, no, not yet, but soon. Uh, but like, but I see that 50% of those tasks have moved over. So you're 50% there, right? And I'm like, mm, maybe. So because the team's constantly learning and they're, they're responding to feedback, right? So they're actually technically working on more technical tasks that weren't even called out in the user story to begin with when we were planning the sprint. So this is starting to make more sense to me. Um, so why should the team care? Well, for the product owner and the team itself, it helps avoiding tasks being completely ignored because they're not interesting to the customer, right? Because the stakeholders don't care. Sometimes my own team doesn't even care if I work on a technical task or move it across the finish line. We're like, oh yeah, I got it to prod and I didn't take it down the process, but uh, not everyone actually sees that uh, or is focused on that is probably a better way of putting it. So. <clears throat> It also gives an appreciation for the technical complexity that's inherent in stories, technical or otherwise. Um, so I'm thinking that the focus on user stories and the de-emphasis on technical stories from an agile coaching perspective is starting to make a lot more sense now. Um, because the agile coaches are basically, what they're trying to say is that, yes, you have to do technical tasks for your projects, but let's report progress in terms of value and delivering what the customers want, right? They don't care about the technical stories. And it kind of muddles up your backlog because when they, when they look at your sprint, they see 12 technical stories and the one thing they asked for, what does that mean, right? It's kind of, kind of messy. <clears throat> so what it seems what was being said to me that day was that technical stories are the tasks that roll up under user stories, <clears throat> albeit incomplete because the team's always learning about more technical tasks that of course have to be done. So this leads me to what Alan was trying to tell me that day, at least to me being someone that was actively focused on both inner source and agile, that was pretty much all the talks I went to for the whole week. And that's that your, code des your code's design must evolve with your team's understanding of the product, right? And this actually does include all the technical work or the tasks that supported the original stories, whether you call them a user story or not. <laughs> I can't tell you how many stories I've found that, yeah, they, they it probably should have been a user story, but they were, you know, closed out several weeks ago, and the team's technically still working on them, even though they're marked done. So it's confusing. <clears throat> 
So then we went over the importance of investing in user stories uh, from a product backlog item perspective, uh, making sure that each product backlog item is independent. Uh, it has no inherent dependencies on any other product backlog items. Uh, they're negotiable, which basically means it leaves space open for discussion. It's not overly prescriptive. And I see this all the time with developers like, it has to be this way. And I'm going to add 13 check subtext criteria that says you, that's never done until they're all checked off. I'm like, no, that's actually not what invest says. It's to it's to have an open dialogue. So it needs to be able to deliver value to your stakeholders. It needs to be estimatable. That seems pretty straightforward. Um, but it needs to be small, and this is the one that's not as easy. Uh, can it be planned, tasked, and prioritized with a level of accuracy? And is it testable? Like, have you does your team have enough information for this one product backlog item that they could actually write tests around it? And the answer I get is usually no. <laughs> So it's good to remember that we need to facilitate these kind of discussions because they're hard. Um, integration is hard, right? So some questions you might want to ask when a story is actually being proposed is the why, what, how, and who. Um, this is a little bit more new to me, uh, but coming from scrum.org, they're, they were saying that you might want to ask why is the story being proposed in the first place? What problem is it intending to resolve? Uh, how does this benefit the business? What's the bottom line? Are you making the business any more money or are you reducing operational overhead? What are you doing? Who benefits from it? What's the impact? Are you impacting two developers who may use it, you know, for a couple hours a year? Or are you impacting 500 developers and all of the consumers that they serve? That's, that's a much different story. So for me, these questions are actually easy to remember to invest. I am working on getting better at the agile terminology for spider and invest and all the cool uh, acronyms that are helpful, but I forget about them a lot, right? Because they don't speak to me like these questions you as a developer. These questions from my perspective indicates my impact both in the industry and in the enterprise, both inside and outside of work. So these are the questions that I value most and that are easier for me to remember even though I'm still working on invest in the spider and all the other cool agile stuff. <clears throat> so what observations can we make from a user story perspective? So if you look for it, you'll actually find that individual contributors already safely disengaged from their sprints anyway. They might not call it that, but they're doing it. So if you, if, if you watch for it, I, I've, I've done this with a number of teams like, oh yeah, okay, this is making more sense. Uh, so what is sprint safe and disengagement? What the hell am I talking about? Um, as I've come to know it in the DevOps Agile environment, sprint safe disengagement basically signals to individual contributors that they can rest easy tonight and into the future, right? Not going to be paged at 2.30 in the morning eight times for three different endpoints that are now offline, hopefully. Um, so sprint safe disengagement um, revolves around code reviews, definition of done, what might the reviewers re reasonably expect, and what's going to boomerang while on call anyways, right? So this goes back to my phenomenon of the team working on stories that have been closed for months. <laughs> They're still working on them. <laughs> you just can't see that in the in the uh, current sprint or the backlog. And then you get a bunch of complaints like, well, there's no transparency on your team, or I can't see what you guys are actually working on. It's like, yeah, that's kind of true, actually. So then the question really becomes, can you really consider a story done when it's still being worked on while the current sprint stories are lagging, right? So as a code reviewer, some of the questions that are going through my head are, what's the code coverage look like? What's the test coverage? Because code coverage, in my experience, usually gets you to a minimum level of testing, like the bare minimum. And then you look at those tests like, yeah, you have 90% code coverage, but the tests still don't tell me what the feature does. <laughs> if this fails in prod, like, what do I do? Uh, so then that leads to my other question. Do you review the code as it's being written day in and day out, or do you wait a week or two for the PR to come? And then you fill in all the gaps. So that two week PR, that two week PR is now a four to six week PR possibly. Um, so from least effort to most, um, what I'm looking for in a PR is I'm looking for log that error, log that info. That's really easy to improve observability a little bit, right? I, what can I see in Splunk? Can I build a Splunk dashboard for some, this feature that's under development? The harder question is what metrics can you offer me? Sometimes it's related to KPIs, but sometimes it's not. Uh, because that's the on-call engineer that has to reason about that and share those URLs with the other teams that are asking them the hard questions. Uh, dashboards and alerting, even way harder. Writing really great alerting that anyone on your team can independently reason about, it's actually not that easy, it turns out. And 
when I'm reviewing a PR, I'm trying to answer the question, if I get paged at 2.30 in the morning, can I restore service by myself in a number of minutes, right? Because I have SREs breathing down my back, so like, give me a status update, give me a status update. Um, and usually the more, more uh, important part is what questions can I answer for you in prod? Uh, what links can I share with you so that we, we could have a real discussion? Rather than like, well, mm, I think it's okay, but I can't really tell. What is okay for everyone else, just not you. <laughs> That's actually my experience more often than not, actually, which is kind of sad. Makes me sad. So I don't like having that kind of response to my stakeholders. So when I mark a PR as needing work, the most common reason over the last couple of years has been for lack of dashboards, lack of code coverage, and insufficient test coverage. Uh, the tests do not adequately tell me what this feature does. So now that I don't have a dashboard and I don't have sufficient metrics, I have to run this test and see what code it covers, but I still can't troubleshoot it probably. So then I might actually end up paging an off-call engineer, or in my case, an off-call architect when I was first hired. And uh, she's tired, I'm tired. She gives me part of the story. I have, I think, what's part of the story. Uh, and then it turns out that it's still offline for eight hours until the following morning because the dashboard actually says everything's online and it's actually offline. <laughs> that was actually the real kicker. Um, but it was still useful to get that feedback, right? So um, the, what the question I'm really trying to answer when I'm doing a code review, whether I'm reviewing your commits iteratively, which I've been doing a lot more lately with my team, I do continuous integration daily. So I'll actually pull from all your remotes and push up commits as necessary because I'm looking for gaps faster. I don't want to wait a week or two for that PR and then now I have to spend a week or two to fill in these gaps for better metrics, better alerting, better dashboards. Because uh, I'm going to do this on call anyway, right? I'd rather work on the user story today, not three months from now when it's burning in prod. Um, that, that, that was the real takeaway. So I'd rather do this work while it's top of mind because my whole team's available. They're not ha the ones that are developing the feature haven't gone on PTO yet for two or four weeks. I could ask some of these crazy questions and they don't always have good answers for me, but they give me some breadcrumbs that I could follow to to see if I could uh, add uh, contribute these these uh, these gaps basically. And my team's benefiting because I'm actually focused on their sprint. I'm not firefighting all the time, and things aren't regressing either. So it's not enough to complain about a PR. What I'm saying is, yes, I will tell you that the PR, I will not approve the PR, but I'm proactively working on it to I can get approval. That's what I'm saying. Um, so I'm focused on gaps. From the on-call engineer's perspective, uh, in top to bottom, in order of self-determination, these are the concerns that usually come up the most often. And it leads up to a possible off-call escalation, which is terrible because now my Ability to get something back in service is now in hours, not minutes, usually in my experience. And so I'm considering all of this during a CI or a code review. Um, so then the question becomes, well, what is Sprint Safe Disengagement actually getting me? It's getting me code reviews that are fast and they stay in the Sprint. Uh, prod support's kept to a minimum. I should have many alerts, but never be paged, right? Being paged after hours should be rare. Um, and your observability is maintained and hopefully improving sprint over sprint, pull request over pull request. It doesn't matter if it's an inner source initiative or you're servicing pull requests or you're actually doing planned sprint work from your originating team, right? And if this all ends up being true or becoming more true over time, what I find, have found is that it actually gives your team the sense that they're not under fire every freaking day. They might actually have time, maybe not a lot, maybe an hour or two, you know, uh, or maybe a few hours a week, maybe, to attend to some of the, the the softer complaints that the team has, like, well, the pipeline doesn't do canary analysis as well as it should, or dashboard should be improved. You have room to address that feedback, and you're not alone, right? I can go ask help from the tech bar or talk to the pipeline team about how I can get some of my business unit's requests uh, answered. But I can't do that without... Sprint safe disengagement, right? So it is inner source. If I'm going to be contributing to inner source initiatives throughout the enterprise, I didn't really get a good sense for what inner. I got a a really nice introduction uh, at OzCon as to what inner source was, but I needed to dig a little bit deeper. So I consulted this book, which was handed out free freely, uh, adopting inner source principles and case studies. 
And from PayPal's perspective, they found that Intersource actually increases collaboration, cross tech knowledge, eases bottlenecks and assists teams in getting needed changes implemented in stacks that they don't own. Or in my experience, uh, make all the repos public, right? That's Intersource. <laughs> That's actually not intersource. So bad if you think that, because that's a good starting point. And this book will give you the reason why that's not intersource. But I, coming in and, and having never heard of this I, and missing all this context, I still think it's good for transparency and, and code sharing and iterating, right? It's all, those are all great reasons to open to make your repos public. And it's a great start in an intersource, but it is not intersource. Um, Let's see. So um, I actually feel Intersource can do a similar thing that it did, for, uh, that open source did for me in 2014, and that's to renew engineers' enthusiasm for the work that they do, both inside and possibly outside the office. So if you're ever feeling frustrated in, in your day-to-day -day work or integrations, which is super frustrating, at least from my perspective, I get all the things to work and never break anything, right? Um, this is a really cathartic read. It's not overly technical. Uh, it was some light, light nightly reading for a couple weeks for me. Um, and it gave me a sense of perspective uh, from various other companies and organizations uh, around the world, actually. A lot of anecdotes. Um, so if we're going to supplement with Intersource, um, why, why would we want to do that? Well, I feel like pipelines are a, a really great example of this, right? You have a lot of business units that need canary pipelines or, or would like them because their engineers are spending, let's say, 50% of their time in operations overhead and they want to maybe reduce it to 25% would be nice. But who has three months to do the perfect pipeline? <laughs> no one that I've talked to, but everyone has an opinion on it. So if you could pull in a pipeline from another part of the organization that you like and gets you 80% of the way there, that's 80% of budget you don't need. That's 80% of the work you don't need to take on. There's other, far other examples. The pipelines are just the ones that I hear about the most. So momentum's greater and wider is another way to look at it. it. The scope is way beyond what your business unit would reasonably budget for, most likely. Uh, there's going to be less ongoing maintenance. Build systems fail. Build systems change. You don't really know where the winds of change are going to take you. <laughs> so it's kind of nice that you could, you know, do some collaboration with some of the other folks throughout the, the department and uh, leverage some of the budgeted uh, teams that you have, such as the pipeline team that kind of curates this. But you could also talk to a recent contributor. And, you know, I mean, they, ha they, they now have a better view of the landscape as of when they contributed, right? Because if I haven't contributed to the pipelines in three months, my information is three months out of date. So this is really great feedback. Infrastructure changes all the time. All the time. I mean, AWS never changes, right? <laughs> So, uh, and I think from a developer perspective, it's nice to actually feel like you have impact beyond your immediate team and keep your thinking fresh. Uh, one of the pieces of feedback I've gotten repeatedly in the employee networks is that silos get stale really quick. They only last about a year or two. And then it leads to other issues if you aren't encouraging cross-departmental and cross-team uh, collaboration. So it's good to keep things fresh. and. Uh, like I said, act, you take ad, uh, advantage of the internal support that you have throughout the organization. So uh, Ericsson found that Intersource can provide another level of collaboration by sharing backlogs. I've actually never seen this in an Intersource initiative, and I'd love to learn more about it. I have seen it work in cross-domain initiatives. In fact, I'm in the middle of one of these right now, where every stand-up, we have kind of a, 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 a dual backlog where I could see what the other domain is integrating with us directly on and how our stories relate to what they're integrating against. So that's pretty cool. Um, but I'd love to see it from an Intersource perspective, which I haven't seen yet. Uh, Intersource tends to pay a favor of pull requests over feature requests. Um, but again, your team's not gonna have enough time to review those pull requests if they're always on fire, right? So again, say, uh, sprint safe disengagement is vital for this to work. If you're gonna take this seriously, you need to make sure your developers actually have time to actually understand what the code says and not just plainly approve it, which is another problem that's rampant. Um, so, and I've found that the bandwidth for these kind of initiatives usually comes from a pain point. <laughs> Prod's not been on fire in various regards for weeks or months, right? is this hasn't been very observable or visible, possibly. Or uh, another pain point such as, um, you know, pipelines. You know, the pipeline doesn't do X, Y, and Z. I would love it if it did X, Y, and Z. So 
business units have all these goals and complaints that they have, right? Um, InterSource actually introduces the concept of a trusted committer, which I was a little bit new to, but it's not anything revolutionary. A trusted committer basically just means that you're not just a committer on your own domain, you're a committer across domain because the value of your contributions have gotten to the point you're such an active member of the community that you no longer have read access, you have write access. And that also comes with some responsibility. Uh, the responsibility being that you should be building up those around you, people that are not yet trusted committers. Why don't they have write access? Well, maybe they don't have enough context around what the impact of prod or the impact of the pipelines or what the general impact of the contributions are. So the idea of a trusted committer is pretty cool as a developer because it means that I can have an impact that uh, is far greater, right? And and I, I get a lot more feedback that I could offer and, and be a, an effective community leader uh, in general. So Europace found that the work shown on a pull request is actually a clearer basis for discussion than informal requirements that were communicated across unit boundaries. This happens all the time from, uh, at least in my experience, where if we just throw up a few JIRA stories or some stickies or team foundation server, if you're on the Microsoft stack, uh, then that, that'll facilitate all the communication we need to uh, figure out what the requirements actually are, and the integration will just work, right? And I actually found that's uh, almost never the case. Uh, but at the minute you start focusing on the code and talking about, well, I, I, I want to open up a pull request to one of the repos that you guys manage or own, the book actually talks about how that's actually a really valuable uh, introduction. You don't want to just say, well, I'm just going to open up a pull request because you might not have uh, enough context if you're new to a repo, right? There, there's probably a lot of, that you don't know or can't see from the readme or the contributing community or any of the other documentation. So if you have that initial conversation, you get some context, and then you submit the pull request, you have some real meaningful discussions around the code rather than fighting over Jira <laughs> or what – or as our scrum master has pointed out, the conflicting mental models that everyone in the room has. And it's unlikely that you're all gonna have the same mental model at any point in time. So the more you can focus on the code, the better. And Erickson found that the best contributions are small and frequent. I know it sounds obvious, but these are the commits and pull requests that are gonna be blamed or annotated when people are pulling up an IntelliJ or on Bitbucket, right? So it, it's important. I would also add that they should be deployable or usable in prod, right? And this is, goes beyond just services. Um, if I'm contributing to a command line interface or a job, um, you should reasonably expect that if you use my automation, it won't take your production system down, right? That my contribution will give you enough feedback to make informed decisions. So that's what I mean by deployable, or usable, and prod. So how do you leverage InterSource? Uh, well, I would say pull in what's available um, gather as much feedback or context as you can. As I will admit, I wasn't really being so embroiled in my own domain. It's sometimes a, a big ask to be like, well, what if you contribute to the R repo the projects over here? It's like, mm, I don't know what's in it for me. <laughs> and it sounds terrible to say that, but it's kind of true, right? And if, if you look at the Adopting InterSource book, uh, there's numerous organizations that have the same observation, is that business units expect some value back first, usually. And that and they talk about, uh, and, the, and the book's a really great book because it talks about if you really have an InterSource pro uh, project that you feel like can have impact across domains, some of the uh, strategies and tactics you might employ to get enough momentum behind it. So not only do they consume it, but they contribute back. Um, and I would say attending, uh, just attending a community of practice is vital for this. We, we have an amazing set of communities here that's some of the best that I've ever experienced in my 18-year career. Um, and go where any other community gatherings are to gather feedback. Contribute or demo improvements in a related COP. Your business unit has plenty of complaints and concerns, I assure you. <laughs> so bring those with you. Um, and try to ask questions in the community of practice around all your pain points and the complaints you hear. We all hear them every day, right? Um, because those, act those conversations actually give you an idea of what pain points have momentum throughout the rest of the organization that you can just pull from, and that also supports InterSource uh, a little easier. Uh, and it also tells you the riskier ones that you're probably not going to get a ton of support for in the short run, right? And it's good to have that feedback up front because if you have it up front, you can consult texts like this and, and uh, maybe 
bring up in some of these communities that, hey, I, I think this would be valuable and you can gauge where you could get your support. So the last thing that I, I noticed was uh, InterSource favors inter being inter enterprise aware. Don't try to innovate the entire architecture all at once. That's super, I know, especially a senior dev, it's actually super tempting, right? It's like, I under, finally have a full understanding of the stack and it's going to move all these. And like, no, no, there's probably feedback loops that you're not aware of that will probably take months to get back to you. Um, so try to think of your MVPs, your proofs of concepts in terms of what's already deployed throughout the enterprise. And this is hard, right? Because you've got Azure, you've got in, in Western Europe, you've got AWS with a large footprint in North America. Um, so these communities of practice gives you just like a kind of like a flashlight, really, right? Like, well, what is how am I being enterprise aware? Uh, what does your architecture's tech stack look like? You know, you know, that's not always clear. Um, but you still want to keep an eye on innovation. You do want to do that next increment so these communities can give you some insight into what that tiny little innovation increment might be. A lot of my focus is uh, simplifying and reducing operational overhead, right? So that means more managed services. Managed services before doing your own thing. Um, and so I've run into this in the API gateway, right? So I, I've chosen one API in our architecture to migrate off of our architecture onto API gateway. And man, I got a ton of feedback on that, even though it doesn't require bot mitigation, right? Um, so I would say if your employer was kind enough to support you in going to a conference, get, uh, write a blog post, give a talk, share how the experience impacted you. Um, I felt this in my gut and it was a conflict I had to resolve. It was a lot of homework I didn't want to do. Um, but I'm kind of being foolish in front of you guys today, so it's perfectly fine. Um, you're the only one that can tell your story, so just do it. Um, and if you ask about subject matter at the conference or the conference itself, share links to that. Uh, at my last employer, uh, they did blog posts for OzCon. They shared videos, presentation slides, and all that stuff, even if an engineer had nothing to say, right? So it, it doesn't need to be prescriptive. Just share what you can. Uh, when I attended the uh, Community Leadership Summit the weekend uh, leading up to OzCon, I had gotten asked repeatedly by my team, well, what are you doing at OzCon? Why OzCon? Why open source? Why all this? So uh, it was cool because I got to share some GitHub repos that we had developed at the conference, and they got to see some of that development in real time on the weekend and, and back in the office. So it, it's super really cool stuff. Um, and don't forget that to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift because community and inner source, that's what it's all about. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, and I'll be available for the next 15 or 20 minutes for any questions you might have about my experience at OzCon. Thank you.